Okay, well, um, uh, let me begin by just saying that there are two people uh, that are slated to speak here today, and it's only me. So I apologize in advance that Davide is not here. He and I are teammates. We thought we might be co-presenting on, on this, but we are not. So that's all right. Uh, both Davide and I, by the way, are on the SQL Server team. I work at Microsoft, so let's get that kind of just out of the way. <laughs> and uh, it is uh, terrific. It's great. If you guys uh, haven't played around with SQL Server, shame on you, because it's only the best database there is, so it's kind of amazing. It's not the cheapest. I'm not fooling myself. I understand. But uh, uh, it's, it's spectacular. All right, let me tell you just a drop about me. Here's the important part. <clears throat> I am a Star Trek fan. There's no getting past it. And uh, it is, this is me in New York. They had a full, like, remake of the, of the uh, bridge. Golly, it was fab fabulous. So I might have a couple analogies coming up that are Star Trek related. And if that happens, then, can, you know, it's going to be great. And uh, it, it, it's so nice. All right, so this talk is, let me go back to the topic of this talk. I don't know what you thought you were getting yourself into with a talk titled like this. Workflows of Effective Enterprise Data and App Engineer Teams. Crazy. So like you, not like you, I realize a lot of you are not from Colorado. So I'm from Colorado right here. Didn't even realize it when I uh, started getting involved in, with uh, this conference. But I love the fact that it's here so I can be local and so it's terrific. I've lived here most of my life. I have three daughters. I'm married. All the things like that are great. And, and uh, I have always been a developer. I've been an uh, engineer from the beginning all the way from being a consultant to getting started at Microsoft where I was a developer evangelist for many years and then a field engineer as well, so I know a lot about the hard part of engineering. That's the reason I'm a product manager today, because I got out of it just a little bit, but it's funny how like you just can't keep your fingers out of it. Like It's just crazy. So that's, that's me. I've worked now with, gosh, you just can't even imagine the scope of customers that Microsoft has. I don't understand a company that's worth $2 trillion. I don't even understand a company that's worth $1 trillion. I, I don't even understand what a trillion is. It's just an incredible thing. But every single, like, just imagine in your mind a gigantic customer, and they're one of ours. It's weird, right? There's, I mean, there's probably one or two we don't have, but I can't imagine. And... This is basically a talk that's going through some of the pain points that most of these teams are having. And you might think, wow, I'll never be like, just imagine in your mind, some gigantic customer like maybe Visa, right? They're enormous. Like, could I ever have the problems that Visa has? They have the exact same problems that you have. It is amazing how everything scales. And it is the same serious problem that all of you are experiencing in one way or another. They experience the exact same thing. And honestly, they, they have very few rare problems that you aren't also experiencing. It's really strange, right? They also struggle a little bit when it comes to tailoring their queries, getting their queries to run quickly, getting all of their teams to cooperate, making sure all the requirements kind of flow down, dealing with drift of their schema, all of the things that, frankly, we have solved. <laughs> so get ready. That's not totally true, but there's a lot of them that we have solved. So let me, let me just kind of jump through here and talk about the enemies of productivity for a data development team. That's really what we're going to be talking about, and there's a handful of things that are just really a nightmare. Some things are really easy. So let me walk you through what it's like, the way that the industry is going right now as far as managing data. So as you know, all we say is data lakes over and over again. What's a data lake? It's just a database that sometimes is file-based. And everything is moving into this gigantic data store which at the bigger it gets, the more we realize we start to bring it down to smaller data stores again. And so it's not the idea of everything siloed, so then you go to a data lake, everything's like gigantic, so we go back to siloed. It's not like that. But it is a little bit like that, because there are issues on top of everything around governance, around data dictionaries, around access and security and understanding the data that really are difficult. And so we're going to move into a little bit of just best practices around there that we, that we are seeing everybody doing. And as we start seeing the similarities and the, let's say, the, the average of what everyone is doing, we start building tooling to make it easier. And so on the SQL Server side, I am on the developer experiences team. Uh, that includes all, app, all AI involvement in SQL and all the tooling and the like, little gadgets that we make for, to make it easier for developers. So I'll talk about all these things today. And so hopefully I'll get through it all real quickly, and I'll go as quickly as I can. It'll all be very superficial, right? This kind of perfunctory way of looking at things. But I have to because we only have an hour together. Hour, not a full hour. We only have, based on the fact that you started late, I get a little extra time at the end. I'm teasing completely. All right, so let's go back to Tokyo. To this is the uh, the Olympics, and uh, I want to talk about the uh, the oh, the the uh, 
the medals that you would get, right? So we have bronze, silver, and gold. And th they're not in the right order. That's just because of the way you stand when you're on the podium. It is, uh, you know, gold is always in the middle. But this is the way most companies now are organizing their data structurally and conceptually. So this is a little bit less of a logical way of organizing your data and more of a conceptual way of organizing your data. So let me just explain. So we start at the bottom layer, and this is the layer that you may not have. And in a lot of ways, this is the nirvana for a lot of companies just to get to the base. And it is the bronze layer, and the bronze layer says, just give me your data. So imagine you are running a line of business application of some kind, and you have all kinds of data. You have lots of responsibilities, but one of the things that the company has asked you to do is please take all of your data and dump it into a data lake for us so that we can have all of this raw data so we can write cross-department queries so that we can have like a dashboard for our executive or whatever. So good news there is all you have to do is do a quick data dump. Now, the reality of this is it's not as easy as we thought. Now, you're not going to do anything to the data. You're not going to try and clean it up. You're not going to try and dedupe it or anything along those lines. But you have a responsibility to make sure your application is running effectively and fast. And so you say, you can have the data at the end of the day. Now, you're not going to give it to, I'm not going to give it to you at lunchtime. Or you say, you can have it at the end of the week. Or you say, whatever it is that you end up saying, right? Everybody's going to have a different situation. Already, we have issues that the bronze layer is out of date almost before we even start using it. But it really is nice to think that you have this dumping ground, and it really is just a giant trash pile of data that you take all of your data from all of your line of business applications and just throw it in there. And you're like, congratulations. And then all of your report writers just hate everything about you. And it's because they can't see the data, they don't understand the structure of the data, the weird way you've normalized, all the things that are special to your application that either you have done or you have inherited one way or another. So it's not really a blame game, it's just kind of the way it goes. All right, so that's the raw data. The raw data layer, by the way, really nice. If you have a bronze layer today, congratulations, you are ahead of everybody. You are like, I mean, just imagine an entire marathon and there's like five people up front. You're one of the five. It's amazing. You're not going to win the race, but you are way up front. All right, so now, silver. Silver is the, it, it, silver is nice. Silver is really nice. This is it's also nice to have, so it may or may not happen. Silver goes along the lines of this. It is very expensive to have silver. It's very inexpensive to have bronze. Silver, on the other hand, says, I'm going to dedupe all my data, and I'm going to go in and maybe even denormalize a little bit of the data. I'm going to go in and make sure that some of the data is documented. You have a dictionary, so you're able to understand what you have. I'll even go in and change some of the normalization pieces that were kind of weird, and I'll fix all of those as well. If you're a report writer and you go to the silver layer, you're so happy in life because you're able to say, I can make sense of this and perhaps even make it work. So you write a dashboard. Now, you've got some serious problems because silver is already, if, if bronze was out of date, imagine silver, right, already. Just think of the timing. But nonetheless, so the dashboard is now demanded by your CEO, and he's like, I must have this as you know, real-time data. I'm like, real-time data? Whew, that's not going to happen. So can you have near-time data? And that the truth of the matter is we just call near-time real-time, and everybody's happy. But the fact that it goes is that real-time, I mean, what, like the stock market is real-time. That I understand, right? But if you're make, making widgets, right, in Wisconsin, and all of a sudden you decide you have to have real-time inventory data for all of your widgets in Wisconsin, then you don't understand the cost ratio of things and how, how quickly you get the data. So if you say, I need to have this up-to-date every Monday morning, like, I could do that. Just give me a small team, and we can make that happen. I need to have this every single morning. I'm like, it's going to be serious. We're going to have to change some things. So all the line of business owners are going to have to agree with me so they can give me their data so that we can do it every morning. It's going to be a hassle, but I can do it. Great. Or he's like, it's got to be, every, I, if I hit refresh, it better show the missing piece that, that fell out of inventory. Like, all right. Just give me an extra $16 million, and the regular team, I, and that's the way it goes, right? This is weird sort of trajectory of price with time. As the time goes down, the price goes up. Silver is not that. Silver is not real time. Silver is just clean and easy to make it so that you can start digesting the data and putting into things like machine learning and all the other like forward-looking processes that you might have in your company coming forward. So silver is nice but unlikely. Gold, on the other hand, only one person can win gold. That's just kind of the way, like, it is crazy. There's only one winner, and everybody else has the same view. It is, gold is where everything is beautiful. It is this thing where when you talk about it, we all get excited, and we're like, oh, my gosh, we're going to have this layer where every single ID is in sync, 
We're going to have it so we don't have to look up, we don't have look up tables. Everything is going to be organized in a way that makes it useful. People can go in and just intuitively understand my data and start to work with it, and I am ready to go. It is going to be the gold layer, and it is, it is the r layer of data, like the, the data of record, right? That's what it is, and I'm going to love it, and I'm going to have it, and it's going to be impossible to have. So it is really great to sit down around your team and be like, how are we ever going get to get a bronze? Like, can we just get a bronze? Can we just, it's like the participation award. Can we just get there? And then, like, let's think about what's next. And then, you know, you guys can turn into NASA and have a silver layer. That's incredible. And then this gold layer is the dream. And as soon as you have somebody and you're like, hey, like, how many people here are going to dedicate their lives to the gold layer? And that's when layoffs need to happen. It just clean the house of people who are not realistic. Because a gold layer is so difficult to get to that you have to have an amazing business driver to get there because the cost is so high. So I say all that to say this is the medallion strategy. It is the concept that basically every Fortune 500 company is trying to make their data look like. The bronze, the silver, and the gold. And it all has to do with cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Of course, the data has all kinds of issues as it goes up, but it's beautiful once you get to gold. I've never met a customer ever, and trust me, I've talked to more than you have, I have never met a customer that has reached the gold layer, right? A complete silver layer, yet to see, yet to see, right? So it's something to think about when we're talking about philosophy versus technology. That's kind of what's going on. All right, not to discourage you, please shoot for the moon, but don't, just don't like beat yourself up. This is the way that it looks. In the perfect world, I have three line of business systems, each one going from bronze, silver to gold. There's sort of a realistic thing that's going on here that I want to kind of make a point of, and that is they're not all going to make it, and let me go here. The first issue is around storage. So it's beautiful that storage is no longer an issue to us, right? It's three cents a gigabyte. I mean, I'll write the check. I mean, that seems so easy. The entire company's data can fit on a, now on like a 50 cent thing, right? So it's amazing. And uh, so it's no longer, that used to be the issue. Like, whoa, 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 you're just going to copy all of this data? Do you re realize how many terabytes we have? You're like, how many? Like, who even cares anymore? So it's an amazing thing to be able to do that. So we have... One, two, three copies of your data, and they slowly get larger as you go to each one. You would think they'd get smaller, but they don't. They get larger. You're like, aren't you deduping? You are deduping, but you're also denormalizing at the same time. So your data slowly gets bigger and bigger, sometimes faster. It gets really big fast. Not a big deal, right, because it's not, that big, it's not a cost measure. It's really a, more of a concept. The next is around time and how fast that dashboard is going to be up to date. And uh, it's a serious issue, right? It's a serious issue around it. Each one is going to take some serious time, and you can't do everything in parallel. Most of the things you can't do in parallel, as a matter of fact. So you have to like, think to yourself, how fast can an electron actually move across the wire? At the speed of light? Or, if your boss really pushes, can you make it faster? It turns out, no. You cannot make it go any faster than it can actually go. So you have processing time, and you have the speed that's going to happen, but then you have the laws of physics, which can only be broken by Scotty. All right, so um, one of the lessons that you must learn and so we have a product called Azure Data Factory. Forget the fact that we have a product called Azure Data Factory. It is just an ETL tool. If you and your data team are excited about this idea of moving data from one place to another, your initial reaction, because it's everybody's initial reaction, is going to open up Databricks, open up a nice little Jupyter notebook, and start writing your ETL from scratch in a script that you're writing inside Python. It's just the way it goes. If I, have, if I had a quarter for each one, I wouldn't be here today. I mean, it's amazing how everybody thinks, why would I need Azure Data Factory when I can write my own tooling to do the entire thing? Because even though this may have cost like a million man hours, whatever that is, to actually create from an engineering point of view, I can do it this week, and my team could finish, and it's going to be incredible. Well, yeah, but what about logging? We'll add logging to it. All right, that's cool. What about extra like uh, uh, observability to make sure we'll add that to it as well? What about bringing certain things together so there's less reusable code? Like, uh, we'll add that to it. Pretty soon you built Azure Data Factory, and then what happens next is you are maintaining Azure Data Factory instead of moving anything closer to gold. And so you have this thing where you have, why are we stuck in silver? Well, part of the reason we're stuck in silver is we decided to not look at tooling and just use Let's write all the tooling from scratch. This happens all over the place. It's because we're engineers. We want to build it ourselves because we know we can do it right. And we can make it so lean and small. But the fact of the matter is it, you end up just diverting your eyes from the goal and you get totally trapped. So please, please use Azure Data Factory or some tool that's equivalent to that so that you aren't writing your own ETL solution. All right. The next is around database development. This is where my heart is the, probably the strongest. Certainly where a lot of the tooling inside my team we pay the most attention to because there's so many things that are so easy to solve, but so difficult at the same time. So imagine this. You have a database that you're trying to interact with. 
Uh, I'm I, uh, whatever line of business application one. We're we're using SQL Server, of course, because it's the best database. And while I'm interacting with that database, you are also a developer on my team. You decide you will also interact with this database. That's no big deal. I'm writing the products. I'm writing the products table. You're writing the users table. So that's fine. We totally don't interact with each other. No big deal. Maybe there's a join. Maybe there's a constraint. But we shake hands and we work it out over lunch. No big deal. Then we add somebody else to our team, and then somebody else. And time starts to pass. And the problem is, instead of using an actual development platform like you, we do for every other line of code that we write, in databases, we interact with this like permanent piece of technology, and we interact with it as if it's source control. And it is brutally painful because you just hired me onto your team, and I'm not that great of a developer. And I go in and mistakenly delete a few tables. But I don't tell you because I'm like, this is embarrassing. So I just recreate them the way they should be. And you're like, wait a minute. There's a few things missing that you notice two weeks later because I never fessed up to it because the last thing I want to be is the new guy who deleted something. And now all of a sudden, everything is in out of sync because the code that you wrote relies on some of those artifacts that are now missing. Right? That sort of thing is what we keep doing into databases. We use it as if it's a development platform instead of using it as if it's just a storage device. All right, not to super simplify my own product here. All right, biggest problem is database details. The settings inside a database are really difficult. They're, you would think you just run a database and go, but that's not true. A database has dozens if not hundreds of settings that must be configured. Most of us take the default because we're not quite sure what they even do. But then we assume that they're there, and that re really starts to hurt. So now let time go by again. We have all these settings in our database, and then the administrator, this stupid DBA who is not a developer and doesn't have any idea what he's doing, comes in and with security best practices changes some of our settings so that we no longer can interact with our database the way we thought it was going to work. Everything breaks, and we have no idea why, because there's hundreds of database settings, and only a handful of little hidden ones in the corner were changed by somebody who didn't go to lunch with us and tell us about it. And so now we're in this really heartache situation where we're not able to keep track of the incredible details that are, that are in the database and have nothing to do with our application. We're writing tables and store procedures and views and all the other things. Those settings weren't even in the, like, like the distant part of our mind, let alone to know they would be the problem that would make our application fail. Second problem. The second problem is we have this tiny little amount of drift. Often we talk about like, you know, you have to have an agile company so that you can really, you know, the market shifts and you can change too. Sure, but just imagine small things instead. Like you want to change full name to first name and last name, or just little things that happen here and there to make it better because the developer that came before you just made a few decisions that were more like debt than they were good decisions. Now you're just going to tweak those along the way, and we have this drift and the impact of all those changes, which are so small and so subtle. And over time, I'm not able to roll through time and say, I want to go back to May because we had an issue in May. Because it's too late. The schema has already been dramatically changed. And the way we have it today is not a reflection of May, and I don't even know what to do anymore. Right? So we have the same problem in code. That's the reason we have source control. And source control is going to be a big part of the solution for everything. The rest is around hidden errors. It turns out that if you write a table and then write a store procedure against that table, and you try and reference a column that's not actually there, you'll get an error. Terrific. So you write a store procedure correctly, but then you go back to the table to make a change, and that store procedure no longer gets an error. You just broke your store procedure by changing the schema of your table. It's not that big of a deal, except for this disconnect makes it even harder to know what you're actually impacting when you're making these small changes to the schema. Right? It's just this constant, like, just imagine being on this poor data team, like the hard life that they have. And imagine the walls they built. They're like, don't touch anything. Nobody freaking touch anything. You're like, hey, can we change full name to first name and last name? Yeah, it's going to take nine months. You're like, what? You're like, that's a long time. You're like, just one field? Yeah, you don't understand. And so it's just that sort of thing because it's so difficult to find. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. I clicked twice. But let's see. Well, my gosh, what is going on here? Hang on. Sorry. Here we go. This is where I wanted to be. Okay, so we fix it. We fix it by making so that interaction and development against the databases is declarative instead of going against the database directly. That means you write it in code. You write, it, you write the code in a way that says the way, you want the, the way you want the database to look. And that's it. And from that point forward, we have the tooling to take your declarations and apply them to the database for you. All the differences, so we make it so that as you have uh, schema differences, we can Identify what all those differences are programmatically for you. And we are, okay, this mouse is going to not be my friend. I'm just going to move that right there. All right. Um, 
So we as SQL Server, well, we understand all the details inside the database. And so, in fact, any other type of database still makes the most sense that I'm going to use tooling to be able to find all of the different settings and figure out how those have changed over time. Right? That's really important. The next is making it model-based. So once it's model-based, it works as if it's code. I can build it, and I will get build errors if I've made a mistake. That is unbelievable. Not only that, but it, because I can build it, I also have a compiler behind the scenes that now gives me IntelliSense or the intelligence on top of it to be able to say things like, um, if I need to rename something, I can semantically rename it. So how do we do renaming today? If I need to change first name to full name or full name to first name, I do a quick little search, where is full name? And I'm doing a text search. It's the most ridiculous thing you can imagine and the reason it's so error prone. And so we get past all that and don't forget because the, the junior developers are using star for all their queries, so you can't even figure out some of the things that are happening. And so because we don't do that, but outside of this room, these people are crazy. Yeah. All right, and so, and then this idea of multi-targeting. With only, an, let's see, <clears throat> I'm done at five, is that right? Okay, I got, I got a hustle. So, here we go, there's so much to tell you, it's so nice, all right. If you use Visual Studio Code instead of Visual Studio, then you can use the MSSQL extension. I can't even imagine why you would, because the one in Visual Studio is so much nicer. And I say nicer just because it's the Visual Studio environment instead of the little brother, I'm like, come on. Um, so we call it the data, Storage, uh, no, we call it the SQL Server Developer Tools, SSDT, but it, it installs really easily with um, the workload of data storage and processing. You get it for free. You can see it's the very first one. Well, it's really hard to see. This projector makes it, look how it's all the space that's lost around the edge. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, it says SQL Server Data Tools, SSDT. And these are the tools. They're similar, by the way. I'm telling you how this works for SQL Server, but there are other tools that do very similar for Postgres and other tools, too. So don't feel like you're, I'm only talking about SQL. I'm really talking about some of the capabilities we've built and other people have copied. And that's totally OK, right? It's a little bit like when C Sharp invented async, and then all of a sudden JavaScript is claiming they invented async. I'm like, Java? It doesn't make sense to me. All right, so sorry. I think I changed technologies by mistake. So now I can create a project that's actually a SQL project. I'll show you what that looks like here in just a second. But then I can target it to the exact same type of database I want. Now, so, so just imagine this. You had to build on SQL 2019 as an example. And they're like, OK, time to upgrade to 2022. No problem. Let me just change my application to target 2022 and see what breaks. Wow, that is an impossible scenario any other way. What are you going to do otherwise? Back up to 2019 into 2022 and then try and look through the console logs to figure out what's wrong? That's a nightmare. We can actually fix it in the tool just by retargeting. Right? So it's really, really great. And these things happen, right? It's OK that we use old versions of software. That's just the way it kind of goes. We just have to have a plan when we go forward. We also have every single database setting that's possible. Right? So everything is in here, and we built it like that on purpose, so it's not a, a subset or any kind of compromise along the way. Then I can synchronize. So this is great, too. I can point to my current development database running on my local machine, and I can say, here's the production database, or maybe my UAT, development, or my UAT device that looks, or database that looks just like production. And I can say, tell me the difference between the two, because somebody's done something, and it's not right. And now, all of a sudden, I can see the one, two, three, ten things, whatever it is that's changed between it, as well as the button that says, just sync them up. I don't, not the other way. You don't want to sync up production with your development device, but sync up your development device, device with production so you can figure out what's going on. That sort of tool, um, it absolutely exists, but you need it in the context of a database project, not in the context of everything else. So we call this DAC pack, D A C P A C. I don't know what it stands for. Isn't that weird? I'm talking about the tool. It's on my team. I have no idea what DAC pack stands for. Data, application. That's the C. I don't know. C container. It's pointless to guess. All right. Let me show you a little bit what it looks like. Uh, hopefully, it looks nice and you're able to see it. Let me uh, just jump over to. I'll show you in Visual Studio. Uh, just know that this capability is also in Visual Studio Code, um, almost exactly, but not exactly the same. Okay, so let me uh, er, pay no attention to the extra stuff that's open right now. All right, so I have a project here, and I'll zoom in because I know it's going to be kind of a challenge from the distance. So let me just jump in real quick. And so if I were to collapse everything, let me do that. I have three projects here, database, database test, and test runner. Let's just focus on database for a second. This is the database project that holds everything you need for your database. Now, my database is simple, 
It, I've organized everything into folders. This has nothing to do with SQL Server. It's how I like to organize things, how my team has decided to organize things, not how the project re requires that you do. So let me expand and show you. I have one table in my database. It's a very complicated database. And it has all of the customers. It has a view against all of the customers. And it has a procedure that changes a value. So it's just to show you what that things exist and where, how they would go. But when I go into the table, oops, there we go. When I, <laughs> when I go into the customers table, it looks like, now how can I move this without, we'll do it like that, how oh, beautiful. It looks like a designer. In fact, I've got I to gotta back out of this just so you can see the entire thing that's open. So it looks like a designer on top, which is nice because not all of us are familiar with the intro T SQL syntax to get everything right for whatever your database is. That's nice, but at the bottom you can see it's the raw code that's actually there. This is just a visualizer so I could see it. It's interactive if I needed it to be. But let me show you something that's cool that I can do. So I can right click on full name because F name turns out we have a bunch of like totally immature people on our team and they think it's hilarious. And they're like, okay, well, we're going to take F name and we're going to change it to be full name or front first name, right? So I say right click and rename. But now this is symbolic renaming because I have a compiler now behind the scenes that knows the difference between F N A M E, the text, and F name, the column name. Everywhere that I need to rename it, let's just say I change it to full name. Everywhere that I need to change it will show up here, and it'll say, okay, well, FYI, it, it's used in a view. It's also used in a server procedure. And, and do you want to change all of those or only want to change this one? I'm like, I want to change all of them. And beautiful. Now, all of a sudden, I realize I can make a significant change that is reflected immediately across the entire database. And if I am lazy, which I sometimes am, and I go in and I just type full like this, and I try and build... Let's hope this demo works. If I, and I try and build, it'll give me an error saying that there are certain things referencing a column that doesn't actually exist. There's no other way to do this except for to actually execute the store procedure in SQL and find the error. Like it's brutal to change all of these schema names without do it using a tool like this. And yet we still do it all the time, right? Not because we're lazy, just because we don't know any better sometimes. All right, so there's my error. I have two errors, and it's saying there's a view and a store procedure referencing F name that doesn't exist. So there you go. It, it's so small that you have no idea if I'm telling you the truth or if it says it doesn't work. You have no idea. Okay, because I'm a little low, show on time, just know that, the, that it, there's so much more you could do. There's so much more you could do. All right, this is me being honest with you. There are other tools that do the same thing. If you're like, I don't know about this, using a free tool, okay, you can pay for these tools as well, and they, you can use Liquibase, Fly, DB up, whatever it is that makes your day. And there's something they, they can do that's really special, and it is they can integrate into your CI CD pipeline and automate every this, everything from the command line, which means I can use these same tools, and I can say, that synchronization thing is really cool. It really is cool. And so now I can take my exact same project that my de developer team just worked on, and I can hand it over to a, to a DevOps pipeline that somebody else has built and automate the synchronization and pushing it up to, into UAT or wherever it needs to go automatically. First, making sure that it builds. Second, making sure that everything is the way I want it to be. Linting it and all the other pieces that I want to make sure work. Then I can do the publishing as well. So that's SQL package is what we call it. But the others do the same thing. And the whole idea is incremental updates to your database to make it so you're not, you're not upgrading from one database to another, but you're updating from code to database. All right. The next killer of productivity here is the environment. You're going to love this. If you don't know some of these things, these are just really cool. All right, the first is if you don't know that WinGit already exists, then congratulations, today is the day that you learn that WinGit exists, right? So we all love chocolatey. I've used chocolatey a million times myself. WinGit is Microsoft's chocolatey. The reason this matters is because WinGit comes built in now to, see, to Windows. You get it just for free. It's sitting there looking at you, and you can just say WinGit SSMS, and you get SMS installed. You don't have to figure out where do I download it. Am I being tricked by some fake link that isn't right? You know, download.ru, and all the things that we accidentally do and install it. All of the things are curated and put onto WinGit the way they're supposed to be, and every Microsoft tool is installable there. Do I still need chocolatey? No, I mean, sure, why not? I mean, I don't want to start a war here. Yeah, chocolate is wonderful. Please keep using it. However, you would be surprised just how many things you can accomplish now with WinGit that's built in. And I say that because now all the SQL tools are also built into it, as well as you can just install Visual Studio. WinGit, install Visual Studio. It's kind of insane how cool it is. All right, I don't want to spend too much time on the easiest thing in the world. The next is around SQL CMD. So we had this tool called SQL Command. SQL CMD. It's a command line tool to interact with a database, and um, we it uh, we and we created another tool, 
and use, reuse the name. So now we have two tools called SQL command. We have SQL command and we have SQL command. And the new SQL command is backwards compatible completely with the old SQL command. So you don't know that you don't have it. It just happens to have all these extra features. The other fe there's a one feature that you're going to really like. And that's the fact that it's now cross-platform, rewritten in Go, and it runs everywhere you want it to go. That matters because SQL is also cross-platform. And so you want to have a tool that can run anywhere. So it used to be that you would have SQL Server running on your Linux device, and then you would have SQL, you'd have a special VM running SQL command because it only ran on Windows. Those days are behind us. But what's nice about SQL command and what it can do today that it couldn't do before is it can completely interact with for you to Docker. So if you are a developer and you're trying to get SQL Server up and running as fast as you possibly can, get a look. Well, just come on. This will be the best demo of the night right here. All right. So doo -doo 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 -doo. is that big enough? Yeah. That's, I mean, I hope that's big enough. I'm, I'll make it bigger. All right. So if I said if I were going to interact with SQL or the SQL command and I were to use this command, SQL create MS SQL, that is saying create, uh, create a SQL server for me. And where is it going to create that SQL server? It's going to create a quick little container, right? It's just going to use a container, which is nice. If you didn't know the SQL is containerized, it is containerized, which is where you should be using it in your CI CD pipeline. You should be deploying into containers because you can do it over and over again at an insane speed. Then I could say, in this case, I could say use back, so it's immediately going to create the SQL server and then restore a backup file for me as well. I have one called sample, which is just Northwind. And accept the EULA. EULA stands for, hang on, EULA, end user license agreement. It's just something that's required. And then um, open it up in Azure Data, Azure Data Studio, which is like the cross-platform SSMS, so you know. The SSMS is our query tool. And then cache just says, don't download it again, just run it. Now, the reason I want you to see this is because it's insanely fast. I, don't, I mean, it's not like instantly there, but it is really fast. I'll back up just a little so you can see all the, the uh, commands as they come along. So it should probably in about 20 seconds have all of this finished, which is important. Not only does it mean that your CI CD pipeline can deploy and be really fast so that all the gates you have for your PRs can still interact with a real database, but it also means you as a developer can say just, you can pick whatever version of SQL you want. And so I can have a container of 2016, I don't care what it is, right, whatever it is, and boom, it's ready to go, backed up to the where I want it to be, points at a DAC pack that points at one of my projects if I have that instead of a backup file, whatever it is that I want. And then, so this is, this little cutesy output is just because I wanted to show that it finished, and then I did a quick little query here just to prove that the database was there. It's the products table, right? So they're, they're selling helmets, mountain bikes. But pretty neat nonetheless, right? I mean, that's pretty fast. I don't know how fast that was, but it's pretty fast to have a container of SQL just up and going, ready to go. I can query against it, and I can start interacting with it, destroy it, create it again, destroy it, create it again. I can do that 500 times before lunch. So it's just really nice to be able to control my environment really quickly and not say to your developers, you have to install SQL Server. Now, here's the reason that matters, because a lot of people have downgraded to using only Macs. Stupid. All right. It is true, though. Golly, that has created so many problems for us. Oh, God. How are we going to handle all these Mac users? I'm also a uh, professor of uh, computer science here at, at uh, Colorado Christian University. And uh, we require Windows laptops, which means about half the class still has a Mac, right? Because they're, they, they saw the commercial with the hammer. And they're like, I'll do whatever I want. All right. And so I have to come up with, of course, how am I going to teach C Sharp without Visual Studio? So they have to use VS Code. They're like, ah, it doesn't seem as nice as I thought it would be. Yeah, it's because you're using a Mac. And it's just one of those things where you're like, it's totally workable. But it's not the same. It's not the same, right? It, it's like a generic prescription in a way. All right. Uh, all right, great. I already showed you that, which is terrific. And uh, oh, one thing, if you may not know this, is Polyglot Notebooks, by the way, I'm not saying don't use VS Code. I use VS Code all the time. This is just me being obnoxious about Visual Studio. But the uh, Polyglot Notebooks allow me to write C Sharp, SQL, Python, JavaScript, and other languages that, and other languages, JavaScript is why I said that. Um, in one notebook. It's super awesome. So if you need to write something to explain to your team, here's how you interact with the database, then here's how you use it inside a class, here's how you deserialize it, reserialize it, whatever it is, it's all right there inside a single notebook. That's an incredible capability that isn't there before. So really, really cool. I'm not going to show you that, but I will show you this. So AI is, gonna, is a, an important part of our charter. The way we interact with uh, 
the developer, the way the developer interacts with the database using some sort of AI. I, I know everybody is talking about this. And trust me, it is so much harder than everybody makes it look. It's amazing. They're like, ah, oh, you just do this thing. And uh, anyway, so here's a quick video. That I'll just kind of talk through it. Just know that it's not super important that you see what's going on. You, some of you have probably even seen demos like this. But now we're building it into the tool. So for example, this one just has a JSON block. It doesn't matter if you can't see it. Let me just explain that it takes a JSON block, infers what the schema is supposed to be on behind the scenes. We can already do that now into C Sharp classes, super easy. Now we can do it into not just tables that make sense, because ChatGPT is bright, but we can actually do it into the standards-based piece that we want to, all leveraging some sort of like enterprise system on the back end that allows your your enterprise architects to control the structure of what's actually created. Um, this next piece is just in case you don't know how to set all of the extra little details of a database. Well, it turns out we're going to build the AI, right? This is all in process. It's, it takes a while. So we're building the AI that understands all of the pieces and the right way to set them and then looks and reflects back on your database to make sure that we understand what it is we're changing so we change your database correctly, right? That's really hard. Today, if you ask AI, how do I change this thing? It'll give you a reference to a generic database and then you translate it into your own. Now those days are going to be behind us. Now it's just like, hey, I need to change the collation to something else. It'll just change the collation for you. So it's really really nice. Another set of features that uh, the last thing that you didn't see was it created a covering index. So to be able to create a query, so imagine this, you know, a covering index is an index, index that covers every column that's selected and every column in the where and every column in the join, right? That's just the way it goes. It makes it the, it's the fastest possible index you can do. Yeah, it can cause some serious problems, but it's, uh, it's still great either way. Um, oh, did I, did I do something, guys? Here, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it right there. Um, there's a couple other things we're adding with, uh, uh, with AI today, so just FYI, because it's fun to talk about these things. Um, we're going to have the ability soon for us to, so we're adding vector types, of course, because vector searches allow us to turn everything into numbers. And so right now, if you're like, when you ask a question, it's, it's all numeric behind the scenes. You just think it's all in English. And uh, so be able to store that data properly, we have to store it as a new type inside the database. There are dedicated databases that only store vector types. That's exhausting to think about, right? Why have so many different types of databases? Why not have the best data in the base in the world and just add a data type called vector? And so that's what we're doing. And so soon all the vectorization will be there, which means you'll have, what would be a great example? You'll have all of your, I don't know, comments on your on your uh, products and you'll be able to vectorize all the sentiment around it as well. Or you'll be able to have all the titles for all the books in your library. Let's just say it's a lot. Let's say it's Audible, for example. And you have the longest list you can imagine. We'll vectorize the entire thing. And I could say, find all the books that are about cooking. And that vector search of finding just cooking will turn back all the, we return all the things that are actually about cooking, regardless of the words that are there. So it's far more than a full text search. Another thing you can do is, uh, I, I, there's a, I'm walking the line on what I can and can't tell you. Um, so uh, another thing you can do is, uh, when you search, it can auto automatically identify something inside a full stre stream um, that is PII, without having to be tagged as PII. So it can automatically star, star, star out somebody's email address just by, by setting a system-wide uh, rule or policy that says, don't show anybody uh, email address or a social security number or whatever without having to go through data masking because data masking requires a specific data type or that it stor is stored in, s in a specific data column. So you don't have to even think about that. Just mix it in with everything, but never give it to anybody because it's good enough to find it. So really neat stuff like that. All right, there's a couple other things, but and they're actually kind of slipping my mind right now. All right, the next problem, here's the, the next problem. The next problem is testing. So regressions mean errors that you introduce after everything worked perfectly, right? That's a regression. We're regressing. And so it's the de-evolution of your application. And it does happen over time, and it's not that big of a deal because we have tests for it, except out of curiosity, just out of honesty, you know, we all have different types of database. I'm not asking if you use SQL Server. How many people have unit tests against their database? Well, you can raise your hand before I finish the question. You're so proud of yourself. That is nice. But you know what? You're my hero in this, and you're the only one. The only one. Well. Well, and she uses Dak back. All right, so she is my hero. I'm really glad you're here. All right, so let's talk about testing. Uh, if you have a table and it stores a date, you don't have to test whether or not it stores a date. 
Uh, SQL just works. They, databases are databases. If you create a class and you create a property in that class that stores the date, you don't write a unit test to see if it stores the date. If you do, you're overwriting. You must be paid by the hour because there is a thing that you don't have to test because that, that's just the language. However, a view is a little bit more complicated and might have some special logic in it that you need to check. But a store procedure is a method. It's a procedure. It is a, it is a method, a function. Can you imagine writing a function in C-sharp and then not writing a unit test and then saying I'm fully tested? Right? I mean, that's crazy. So instead, fully tested. They're like it sounded funny to even say. But the fact of the matter is, uh, if you aren't testing your store procedures, then you actually have execution code that you are not testing. That seems weird, right? It seems really weird. All right, so now I make a small change. My store procedure no longer works. How are you going to know it's not going to work? That's the reason we have users. They will tell you it doesn't work because we deployed it, and they call you up, and they're like, something's not right. You're like, thank you. Cheaper than a test suite, that's for sure. And so we've added a couple of things, and we're going down a road of adding even more things. And so what we don't have, what we do have in C Sharp, what we do have in every other language, is an assert framework that allows me to say assert.equals, assert.true, assert.notNull, all the things you would expect. So now here's an assert schema that you can add to SQL that allows me to write a second store procedure that tests my first store procedure. That's nice. Don't get too excited. Don't get triggered over the fact that I said two store procedures. But the second store procedure that tests my first store procedure runs it and then has asserts at the end that makes sure certain things are the way they're supposed to be. I can run all of this, by the way, in a transaction, and I could say delete all the data in my database in my transaction, and then I could say insert only the known data so when I run my stored procedure, I know exactly what it's going to do. This mouse is not my friend. Um, so the assert makes it really easy. If you, if you haven't copied that down, go ahead and copy it because it's super handy. It takes you to my gist that I wrote, so it's great. All right, this is the C Sharp, this it, right here. You are looking at this C Sharp unit test that will execute every store procedure that is a unit test in your database. This is the only thing you need to do. There are other ways to do it, by the way. I understand that. You can use like T SQL T and other things like that. This is the easiest because not only am I a C Sharp developer, so are my team. They love C Sharp. They love the normal language that they're in in the first place. You're like, well, you could use a special tool or you could just write these 12 lines of code, if it's even that, that execute everything inside your, and run it in your CI CD pipeline and it works just like a unit test. That's the way I want it to be because I have an assert framework now inside my store procedures that makes it work. All right, so back to DAC packs and the way that these tools work. Let me show you this one cool thing and then I'll jump out really fast. All right. Uh, let's see, do, 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 uh, plus, Windows plus plus, that's how that shows up. All right, so check this out. So I have this other one that I was like, don't pay attention to the second, second project. But the second project is called Database Test. These are all the store procedures that I have written to test my original database. I keep it in a separate project because they're completely isolated and I would never deploy this into production. However, I do deploy into dev, I do deploy into all these other places where I want to make sure my tests are run. But then when I get to, the, to production, I would never deploy it. And so what makes it easy is I can reference a database project just like I can reference a C-sharp project from another. So I can have it so that this is the superset of both projects together. So I, can be a, so I can have reference to all the schema that I have for my production database. But I also have now all the tests hitting up against it. So this is nice. I deploy all of this into whatever it is I'm going to run it against, execute all my store procedures, and I have all my unit tests coming back, green little checks because I do it right the first time. Right? It's really, really nice. No, and I do it with no asserts, so nothing ever goes wrong. All right. So here's an example of what a store procedure looks like that's a unit test. Don't get too excited. You're going to write better ones than this. But remember, you can write the whole thing inside a, inside a transaction. And then at the end, whatever it is you're doing, you just say assert whatever it is that's, that you want it to be. Assert actual rows, uh, null, all the things you would do in C Sharp as well. So it's really, really nice. This throws an exception. And if it fails, it causes your unit test to fail, which causes all your reports to show a little red box because somebody else changed some code. All right. So I say all that to say, we have database inheritance inside the same tooling to make it so that you could do this. So that you can add those database tests without interacting or interfering or polluting your existing schema. You could just have it totally to the side, interacting with it the way you would want it to be and then removing it when you go into production. Right? That's really nice. I hope you see it that way. All right, the last is around productivity. I'm going to go quickly here. Am I out of time? Oh, that's really nice. That's really, really nice. The next is around productivity. Oh, well, let me say, let me jump to the slide that matters then. This one. Yeah. Okay. 
In a normal pipeline, hopefully, your first step is to lent to make sure the developers haven't gone off the rails. The second one is to make sure that it builds, to make sure all of the SQL actually works. The third one is to, make, is to turn it into a script that you'll eventually have a, a user or an actual human review. All of this can be automated so that you don't have to have people do anything, but you don't want to be that guy. You want to make it so that you interact with it before it goes in development. Now, I'm not talking about updating UAT or updating development. I'm just talking about updating production, making that last step a real person that interacts with it. Now, I have a, little, a couple of uh, little circles down here only to make the point that these are all the types of companies that I am working with that do it today. These are the largest breweries, the largest airlines. They all do this pipeline, and they all separate it into the medallion structure or the medallion strategy that, that I was talking about at the beginning. You can't get past the fact this is the, this is the drift right now, if we could call it that way, the direction that everybody in the industry is slowly going with their database and the, their data structure. Even when you hear terms like one lake instead of or, or Lake House, or all the other terms that are super duper, they really are trying to implement the medallion strategy behind the scenes and make it easier because that's what everybody is doing. And so it's very important. All the strategies you see data, uh, data bricks changing to, and all the other things that are happening are all response of the, of the medallion strategy. And it's because there's so much data, we have to figure it out. Everybody s understands that the goal is really silver, not gold, but there is this like high-level dream. And so maybe only a certain department inside your, app inside your company will go to gold, but that's kind of the way it goes. All right, obviously, the remaining one slide. I only have one slide to show, but I don't, I'm out of time. I can't show you this one slide. And that's the one with all of the cool stuff that I was excited to show you about. But you know how it goes when Thomas comes up here, and then he's like pulling me off with the hook. So the only thing I could do is just, that's it. So thank you for letting me talk to you. This is all real stuff. I hope you go and try it.